Thanks for tuning in. This is episode number 162. I want to thank you for taking the time to join me on this episode. I pray that it's a blessing to you. So um, before we uh, jump in, I just want to take just a quick moment to remind you, if you haven't seen, um, on the episode descriptions, there's a few links. There's uh, four books that I've published uh, through Amazon. They're available uh, there's some links there for those, both uh, paperback and Kindle uh, versions for those. Um, also, if you have questions, topics, uh, particular scriptures you would like for me to review, uh, maybe discuss further questions you may have, uh, please feel free to send those my way. I'll be happy to take a look at them, uh, see what I can contribute to uh, understanding. So uh, today we are going to discuss something that I've titled, Are We Selling What Is Not For Sale? Now, I want to preface this food for thought by saying that it isn't specific to gender. Now, I can go either direction, male or female, female or male, men and women are the bride of Christ. Now, the thought occurred to me just the other day that if a woman marries a man for what he can provide for her by way of finances, uh, anything tangible, and then she realizes that in light of that marriage, she must give of herself physically, intimately to her husband. What does that make her? She is exchanging intimacy attached with a price tag. Now, in essence, she is exchanging intimacy for money. And that would make her a prostitute. Now, we don't think about that in those terms because we think of a prostitute as someone who exchanges physical intimacy for money outside of a marriage covenant. But even if she marries the man, she has sold herself to him for a price. But the question remains, for what did she sell herself? Stability? Resources, financial assurance, comfort, safety, but what of love? Now, take this same idea and transfer it to the gospel. How is this any different than what we do when we say, if you don't want to go to hell, then give your heart to Jesus? Or something like heaven or hell, which will we choose? Have we made giving our hearts to Jesus about what he can do for us? Are we not turning people into religious prostitutes? Are we prostituting the good news? Now, is hell real? You better believe it is. Do people go there? Every day, those lost without Jesus Christ are experiencing hell, and we must do everything we can to share what Jesus Christ has made available through his life, death, and resurrection for any who would believe. But have we been selling something that is not for sale? Now, you may ask, how is it we are prostituting people with the gospel? We are exchanging a service, namely escaping hell, for a price. And that price is to subject ourselves to the lordship of Christ. 
Now, that's a good thing, subjecting ourselves to the Lordship of Christ, a necessary thing. But let me say explicitly in all of this what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that if you gave your life to Jesus because you were afraid of hell, it doesn't count. Nor am I saying that if you wanted to go to heaven so you gave your life to Jesus, it doesn't count. I'm not saying those things. What I am saying, though, is when we make receiving what Jesus offers based on what he does for us, we've lost sight of the point of it all, and we've prostituted the good news. If you married your spouse because of what they do for you, how is your relationship now? How was it five years after getting married? When you give of yourself for anything other than love, you enter into slavery and prostitution. For many people, and myself for years, it was slavery from fear. For a large majority of evangelism for more than a hundred years, salvation was a decision based on reciprocal exchange. This idea of I give God and he gives to me. Now we immediately think of a legal courtroom, business contracts, entrepreneurship, goods and services where we are the good and the service we get from Jesus. And you may ask then what's the alternative? I wonder how many people would give of themselves to Jesus based solely on the prospect that they now can be in right relationship with God, and that's all they gained alone. What if hell never came into the question? What if it was never part of the discussion? Or for that matter, if heaven and pearly gates and houses built for his children were neither part of the discussion? I wonder how many people would still give of themselves to Jesus. What if after life was death and the end of it all? Would you still offer yourself to Jesus to become restored to our Heavenly Father? I wonder if the same group of people that would say, you know, I think I'm just going to continue to do my own thing then. Does that group of people who would choose to continue in their own way, are those the people that Jesus classifies as those who would say to him, Lord, Lord, did I not do all these things in your name? And I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Could that be the same group? If eternity of gain were not available, would you still choose Christ? Would those who exchanged themselves still exchange themselves if nothing could be obtained outside of right relationship with God? Would you, the one listening, deny yourself if there were nothing in it for you outside of restored relationship? Do we say yes to Jesus because of what he can do for us? Now, if our honest assessment of this question is yes, then we've turned the gospel into prostitution and we've become peddlers of the good news. So are we selling something that's not for sale? Now, after that sober assessment, make no light, uh, make no mistake that in light of the gospel, an exchange does happen. An exchange has happened. But the question should be, what is the exchange? Well, Jesus exchanged his life for ours. He took our sin to be sin for us. 
2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he, the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin, or some translations say to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, Jesus. Jesus exchanged the punishment deserved to us upon himself, and Jesus gave us life in place of death. Jesus exchanged us beauty for our ashes. Make no mistake, an exchange has been made, but we must be careful to consider what is the exchange. I would also encourage us to carefully consider how we think we exchange. Now, what I mean by that is, what is it that we think we bring to the table? I don't even mean this using the, this some kind of proud way we may offer something to God in exchange for the life of Christ. But just in the purest sense of the idea of exchanging, even using the word exchange itself carries with it a sense of what I give and what I get from it. But notice a very important thing about those things that we mentioned that are exchanged and how that is applied. Life for our death, mercy for our guilt, righteousness for our sin, beauty for our ashes, oil of gladness for our mourning, a garment of praise for our despair. These are all in Isaiah 61. Do you notice a trend Though there, the exchange is made by Jesus. We come, he exchanges. Now, not only does Jesus exchange, but notice what he gives us. It's the exact opposite of what we came carrying. He makes us a people from no people, saints from sinners powerful from purposeless, honor from dishonor, a double portion from lack, everlasting joy from despair. No doubt does an exchange occur, but we bring nothing to the table. We get to sit at the table. Jesus made and makes the exchange for anyone who comes to him. Now, when we receive Jesus, we cannot help but receive what he gives. But upon closer inspection of our heart, we should see what exactly we are coming for. Now, I think most of us would agree that we give ourselves, which actually embodies the declaration that Jesus made to deny yourself. Next, though, comes the question of why. Now, that why answers the question of our motive, our motivation behind why we're doing the giving of ourselves to God through Christ. If we answer that question accurately and without religious wrappings, then we might be surprised to discover that we're doing so on the basis of what God can do for me. Therefore, I will do for God. We must be careful to accurately portray the picture to ourselves and even more importantly to others as to why. Because if we don't, we are selling something that's not for sale. Now I want to begin closing this out with reading some scripture in Matthew 13, 44 through 49. And I want to introduce a different perspective in understanding this portion that many of us have read and understood for years. Now, the traditional understanding, which I have shared as well, has been the way I've approached this until hearing something new recently. Now, just for some context, Jesus is speaking in parables to those around him, 
Then more privately to his disciples, he is teaching and explaining parables to them. Now, after Jesus left the crowds and went into the house, his disciples are asking him to explain the parable of the weeds. Now, it is in the immediate context of his disciples in the privacy of their company that Jesus says something I've never noticed before putting this together. Now look at the end of verse 43, right before he gives the parable of the hidden treasure, pearl of great price, and the parable of the net. Jesus says, he who has ears, let him hear. Now he says that right before telling his disciples three parables. Now first, do you find that odd that he would say something like that to his own disciples. That insinuates that some may not have ears to hear what he is trying to say, even among his own disciples. And that strikes me as interesting because in a previous portion, his disciples actually asked him, Jesus, why do you speak to the people in parables? And he, and he answers them, you know, those that see would not see, those that hear would not hear. But he says, but to you it is given to know the secrets of the kingdom. So his disciples are permitted access into understanding in a way that the general public, that is the people of Israel, those listening, were not permitted to understand. And so the context of Jesus speaking this, explaining this to his disciples, when he'd say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, you would suspect him to say that to the general listener, not to his disciples. So I find that interesting because that, like I said, insinuates that some may not have the ability to hear and truly hear. Now, also, it is not unreasonable to conclude that when Jesus says that, it is serving to set up what he is about to say next, not necessarily what he just finished saying. Because if you notice, Jesus was explaining a parable, and he goes through this explanation, and then at the end of the explanation, he says, those with ears to hear, let them hear. I have automatically distinguished that to somehow be the conclusion of his explanation, but what if it was the pretext for his next parable? Remember, we we have applied verse and chapters, verse numbers and chapters to things. So it could be that Jesus is preparing them to have their spiritual antennas up and ready for what's coming next. So let's read it. This is Matthew 13, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous. So we'll just stop right here. In in the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl of great value, a price, some translations say, I've always held this idea 
that Jesus is the treasure and the pearl, and we are the man and merchant that finds and sells everything to have that treasure. Now, if you're listening, you may have thought that same thing. I have and done so for years. But many of us also know that we love him because he first loved us. Jesus pursued us long before we pursued him. We don't find Jesus. He finds us. You see, we put ourselves too much at the forefront of the gospel. Just to demonstrate that, think about how we actually communicate the gospel. We begin with man's depravity. In the garden, man fell. And then God steps into the storyline to salvage that which man has broken. And so we put man beginning the gospel and God ending it, but God actually begins the gospel. In the beginning, God and so we, we put ourselves at the forefront of the gospel. Also, think what cost could we pay to buy the treasure that is Christ? We couldn't afford it. I submit to you that we've gotten this parable backwards. Rather than us as the man or merchant, it's actually Jesus who sold it all to have that treasure and pearl. Do you want to guess who the treasure is? It's us. Now, religious red tape wants to convince us that we aren't that valuable. But we know differently. Why? Jesus gave it all to bring us back into the family of God. You know the value of something by the price someone is willing to pay for it. Jesus, the Son of Man, discovered His own long before the foundation of the world and kept it hidden until the appropriate time and gave everything. He gave up everything. He sold it all to purchase the field, the treasure, the pearl. He gave everything. He sold it all to have the field, to have the treasure that is you and I. We must portray the gospel accurately. We must take it away from the context of, I give to God, He gives to me. What are we coming to Him for? What are we coming to be saved for? Is it, is it, a, is it an eye-centered salvation? We must portray the gospel accurately so that people know what they are giving themselves to, which must be to love, intimacy, and restored relationship. It's a marriage, not a business contract. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to share this across all continents, countries, states, cities. I ask that you would multiply it in our hearts that you would show us those places that we've taken for granted, those things that we've misunderstood or thought to be so. Not to unravel our faith, not to deconstruct our faith, but to shore it up, to place it on a good foundation, to be rooted in truth, in understanding, to better know who you are in light of what you've done. May we know you more every day. I ask that you would put a, a fire, a hunger, a desire in each listener to know you more, to desire your word, and to rightly navigate the truths that you have made available to us. I thank you in advance for what you're doing. I ask that you would bless each person listening. 
whatever they may be struggling with, going through, you're intimately aware. I'd ask you to to reach your all-powerful hand into their life, their situation, and do in them, upon them, through them, exactly what is necessary, exactly what you have determined. I thank you in advance, and I pray blessings upon each and every one. In Jesus' precious name, amen. If it means that I'm close to you, I would trade a million lifetimes for a moment here.